actually a very, very old message. I'm going to need some help. So I need the young kids to come sit up here. If you count yourself as a young kid, please come sit on the front bench. And that would be me at other churches. I, I always, you know, I want to get up and sit up here. It's not fair. I got gray, so it just don't count. All right, hopefully you guys can see the screen really well, because there's going to be a lot of neat things on the screen for you to see. Now, I notice that surprisingly, everybody got dressed today. I don't see anybody here without clothes on. Well, what is that? How is that important? Where's the mouse? Your spiritual wardrobe. So your wardrobe is all the clothing that you put on, and you probably have a lot of favorite things in your wardrobe. You have shirts, you have some neat pants or slacks or something that you wear, and you have some things in your wardrobe. But what's important is that we have a spiritual wardrobe also. And we tend to forget we have our physical wardrobe, we're good, we run out the door, we forget the things we have to put on as a Christian. God cares in where he always has even in Genesis he says in regarding Jacob God will be with me and will watch over me on the journey I am taking and he'll give me food to eat and clothes to wear God cares about your clothes Deuteronomy 29 verse 5 says during the 40 years that I led you through the desert your clothes did not wear out did you know God cared enough about those Israelites clothes that he kept them from wearing out they couldn't just go to the store. They don't have Walmart. How are you going to go to the store and get a bunch more shirts and clothes and stuff when you're wandering around in the desert for 40 years? God made sure their clothes didn't wear out, nor did the sandals on their feet. God is your fashion. Not Miserati, not Bugatti, not anybody with an Italian name, but God is your fashion. Luke 12 and verse 28. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. God cares about your clothing. Over and over and over, we're going to see this. We also learn something else. God provides you with the tools you need for the tasks he gives. He didn't say, Moses, go on your own and hope you can get those Israelites out. He gave him tools. What do you have in your... Well, it's a staff. Take the staff and throw it down and become the snake. All that stuff, he gave them tools to provide what they needed for their task. It's true today. God's not going to send us out unequipped and unprepared for our tasks. Here's my physical wardrobe. This is my whole physical wardrobe. And I hope you can see some of it. I can't probably make out too well. I know what they are. <laughs> you may not know. So up here on this side... Uh, I've got some of my heavier jackets. I never wear those. They're in those plastic bags. Never wear them. Uh, over here, a uh, radiation jacket. You always need a radiation jacket. <laughs> some of my work. This one is a church shirt. It has an emblem on it. Uh, of course, you need a hazmat suit if you're ever out on the side of the road and you need to look like a giant orange glowing thing. Uh, pirating gear. Right here we have pirating gear. Definitely need that. Uh, this is the only t-shirt I own and I wear it one time a year. This is the 4th of July t-shirt. It's got uh, Wiley Coyote and he's playing with fireworks. Some shoes, some boxes of extra clothing I never wear, and a bunch of shirts for work, and some pants. That's my physical wardrobe, and I know all about it. I'm intimate with every stain. You know, this shirt right here, there's a white stain right there. I know how it got there, and I remember it, and I love it. And so I'm not going to throw it away because I know what I did to get this white stain on my shirt. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you start naked. People forget this. You start out naked. And as a Christian, the same thing is true. You are naked until you're clothed with spiritual things. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 through 3. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we'll not be found naked. We do not be want to be found naked, spiritually naked. That's kind of a scary thought. Yet, I'm going to generalize. Most Christians are spiritually naked. They have not decided to put all these things on. And here's how it works. They say, all right, I'm going to be a good Christian. 
and I'm not going to sin. Okay? So I am not stealing. Okay, good. You're good at not stealing. I am not going to lie. I'm going to be the best non-liar there is. Okay? So you're not lying. You're still at zero. You haven't gone anywhere. You haven't done anything. But I'm real good at not cursing. I can control my tongue pretty well. I, uh, so as we move in our Christian life, we tend to think in the terms of zero. We're never going to make forward progress if we don't put on our clothing and our tools and our armor and get out there and fight some battles. We must learn to acquire our spiritual armaments and our spiritual clothing from God and learn to put them on. First and foremost, I want you to know, you must be clothed with Christ. If you are not clothed with Christ, you are not a Christian. And none of this will matter. Not one word I'm saying will make a difference in anything if you're not clothed with Christ. Because Jesus must be in you for any of this stuff to work. Romans 13, verse 12 through 14, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 27, All of you who are baptized have been clothed with Christ. Clothe yourselves with Christ. Take up your cross daily. This is the first and foremost thing you must put on as a Christian. If you don't, you're not a Christian. Just, that's how there is to it. If your friends are not putting on Jesus Christ, they are not Christians. They are not. Women, what do you wear in your wardrobe? Well, Titus 2 tells us women should dress modestly and decency and propriety and with good deeds and with quietness and with full submission. These are things that God lists and say, woman, this is what you put on. This is what you wear. This is what God cares about as a woman. And there's more for men, for everyone. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. All of these things are the foundational clothing that we wear as Christians. And there are 33 items in Scripture. 33! My picture had about 35, maybe 40 things in it. That's a lot of things to think about. And yet there are that many in Scripture that say, put these things on like clothing. So we've got to learn that. Here's what the bad guys wear. Psalm 109. He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come on him. He found no pleasure in blessing. May it be far from him. He wore cursing as a garment. The people out in the world wear clothing too. They wear cursing like a garment. It flows out of them and it gets on you. And it brings you down, and you take it home, and your mind, and you're tempted to say the same words you saw on television. <coughs> I saw him say that, so I'm going to say that. It gets on you. It enters his body like water, and his bones like oil. Psalm 109, 29. My accusers will be clothed with disgrace and wrapped in shame like a cloak. The world is wrapped in shame. And this is obvious. If you go outside, walk around at the mall and look at the people. Are they clothed in shame? Sure they are. They don't care. They want it as high and as close and as erotic and as dangerous as they can wear it. Because they're clothed in shame. That's what they're clothed with, really. It's not so much the different designers that they're wearing, but they are clothed in shame. And we cannot be like that. It's more than just clothing. Jesus said this, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Now, if you're going up against a wolf, and by the way, the wolves were larger back then, if you've ever seen a dire wolf, they were something you don't mess with, and they travel in packs. They travel with friends, and they gather in swarm and attack in the forest. That's what he was saying. I'm sending you out like meat for this animal. That's what Jesus was saying. A sheep for a wolf. The enemy is using traps, <coughs> bows, thorns, and snares. That's in his arsenal, and he's putting them out there. What do you want to dress in to, to, to fight this battle? Are you ready for it? All right, here's where you guys come in. I'm going to have you give everyone a pencil. Haven, Avery, will you stand up, please? Try to see that everybody gets one of these, okay? So maybe you can start on that side over here, buddy. And give everyone one that wants one. Move all the way over here to this side. There you go. And then move down this side so everyone has some. You thought you weren't going to be doing any kind of test. But I wouldn't be a kind of teacher if I didn't give you a test. And especially a pop quiz, right? Pop quiz. I want you to know, how much do you know about the armor? 
you move past clothing, we're already getting onto the armor position. Try to fill those things out. And if you think you're good at the armor, then I put the numbering in there. <laughs> so if this test came to me, as where I'm at in church, I still would fail. <laughs> what came first? What came second? What came third? What are the names of the pieces of armor? If you don't know this, don't worry about it. You can fill it in while we go. remember any of the pieces of armor. It's pretty important. Now, I remember what my work shirts look like. I remember what my shoes look like. I know what they're, I know the label on the back of them and what they, what brand they are and that kind of thing. How, what do you know about God's armor? Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. By thoroughly equipped, he means all the tools you need are going to be given through scripture. If I want godly armor, the place I look is in the scripture, and I will find it. So that's exciting. Now, on your little paper, which one is number one here? The breastplate of righteousness or the belt of truth? The belt. Now, this is an interesting question. Which one do you want first? You have a choice of one and two here, so you already know the first two answers have been given. You may not know which order they're in. Uh, so here we're going to go. Dun, dun, dun. The belt of truth. The first position, the belt of truth. Why is this? This seems madness. It's a belt of truth. God has armor and weaponry reserved for us. In Jeremiah 50, verse 25. The Lord has opened his arsenal and brought out the weapons of his wrath, for the sovereign Lord Almighty has work to do in the land of the Babylonians. When I call my son and I say, son, we got work to do, the first thing we're going to do is go shop the shop. We're going to find a hammer. 
We're going to find a grinder. And we're going to go build something. So we need our tools, don't we? This is how God works. He opens his arsenal. And he says, I've got work for you guys to do on earth. Here's some arsenal to work with. He didn't just say, go out and I hope you win against, you know, the wolves or the sheep. And Ephesians 6.14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. This is the part we're going to study. Without the belt, you are useless. And I know this very well. Why would God list the belt first, not the helmet? The first thing we would naturally think about is, I need to be saved, right? As a Christian, salvation is the most important thing. I should run and get that helmet. But God didn't do that. He put the belt first. Why not the helmet? It's the foundation. The belt is the foundation for what we're going to go through. It is him. It is his essence, the belt. And we'll see this as we move. All these men in scripture wore a belt. And God made it a point to write out, they had a belt with them while they were going. Elijah, a hairy man, wore a belt. And John the Baptist had a belt. And Jesus wore a belt in Revelations. And the disciples wore belts. And the Israelites wore belts. They all wore belts, and they knew very well how the belts worked. You know, the book of John shows Jesus as truthful 62 times. It talks about Jesus being truth or truthful. Both in the first chapter and in the last chapter of the book of John, Jesus is listed as truth. Why is that? Why is it so important? We've got to figure it out. Our belt was even worn off duty. Other pieces of this armor can fail. Our faith can shrink. It can waver. It can be we're not looking at God's faith and we're trying to make our own. Your salvation, you have to work it out with fear and trembling because sometimes maybe you get in a position where you doubt your salvation. But the truth never changes. It is always true. It is God's foundation. <clears throat> this is why it's first. Any dishonesty makes a lie. It is no longer true. If there's any shade of dishonesty in it, it is no longer true. When I dress like a pirate, the very first thing I need to grab is what? My belt. Because why? My sword is going to fall on the ground if I don't have a belt on. My purse is attached to my belt. And without my belt, my pants are going to fall off. It's just terrible without a belt. It is the foundation piece for all of your armor. Look very carefully. <laughs> Look very carefully at this picture. The world does not get wearing a belt. <laughs> this was my grandfather's worst thing. You know, he was never a complainer. He never got critical of people, except this one thing. Why don't those young men pull up their pants? <laughs> because they, the world just doesn't get it. <clears throat> Truth. The world also does not understand truth. And they give you this product. Look at those beautiful eyes on this thing. See how happy. Here's a smiling face, and it looks wonderful on the package, and you open it, and uh... <laughs> you, have to, you have to use your imagination from, from this picture. And they always put beautiful raspberries on the side. I have never opened a box of cereal that had raspberries in it. Beautiful, fresh raspberries. And yet, on the outside of the box, there's pictures of raspberries. They're lying to me. They're making their product look really good when it's not. Every time I get in the shower, I read this label. This is my wife's shampoo bottle, and it says, In one shampoo, it will erase six months of damage. In one shampoo, she can go from horrible to wonderful. All these things on there, and there's like, fights the fade out, and brilliant shine will occur, and uh, this product is, it eliminates hair damage, and this hair is so healthy it will shine and radiate and call people from the street. And it's a lie! It's a slimy goo. I take it. I played with it. It's interesting. It's goo. I, the world does not get truth. Just like they don't get wearing a belt, they don't get truth. The belt the Roman soldier wore around his waist it was singular. It was a basic holder for his sword and his dagger. It had an apron part that hanged from the front part of the belt. The soldier could fasten the strips of leather down and attach his decoration. And we think these probably were the kind of decorations like a general would have. When a general goes to battle and he wins some competition or some engagement, he gets a little thing, right? He gets little danglies and little 
So he's got the more of these things hanging around his chest, the more you know how much damage he did or how much glory he received in battle. The same thing was true for the Romans. They all didn't get to wear the beautiful plumes on their helmet. Only a few did. They all didn't have dangling things with all these cool campaign stuff. Only a few did. And so that's what we think largely it was. It had tokens and discs on it to signify battles. It is thought that the noise of these things would have been very intimidating. Now we underestimate when we think of soldiers in battle and we think, oh, they're going to do this little tink, tink, tink stuff with their swords, right? Tink, tink, tink. Oh, you got me. Tink, 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 tink. I got you. Tink, tink, tink. No. This man was a meat monster. This man was a gladiator who, for fun, threw Christians in and watched them get eaten by lions. This is the kind of man that was wearing this stuff. He was not a wimp. He was not a coward, and he didn't go tink, 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 tink. He killed people for a living. That was his job. So we always underestimate them when we think about this thing. So here's a Valtez. This is a real Roman Valtez. So if I'm wearing this, I'm going to make a whole lot of noise moving through wherever I'm going. And if 1,500 of these guys are marching in a row, wearing these things, you can imagine what kind of noise that's going to make. It's going to make the enemy flee. The enemy's going to think twice about engaging these people, right? So here's some of the things that dangle from it, and these are all stamped brass. This is where I would hang my dagger or my, my sword around these things. I could tie it right here on my side and hang those. So play with that and look at it. Pass it down if you want. That is what God most likely thought of when he wrote down the belt. And so what we would see is, we thought about the Corinthian armor. I looked at Corinthian armor too, but then I thought, if I were there and at that time period and the Romans had just come in and invaded, I would be thinking most likely Roman armor. That's why Roman armor. In our society, how many of you wear your seat belt? <coughs> You care about that belt? I care about my seat belt. It's a powerful belt. I tried to cut them. Very powerful belt. And in our society, we have phrases the truth is out there, the moment of truth, God's honest truth, or the gospel truth, or as surely as the Lord lives, or tell her the truth, or tighten your belt. Time to tighten our belt. All of these things, we understand the basics of what a belt is for it's a firmness. It's a sense of security. Nothing is going to fall out. We're ready. We're engaging. And we're there. Maybe we have lie detectors. <clears throat> you know, bosses can buy these things. That's what this one is over here at the end. It's uh, where the red light is, and there's this thing. Your boss could put this on his desk and try to determine if you're telling him the truth or if you're lying or not. Now, of course, this is silly because some people are very good chronic liars. Some people lie so much they don't even know they're lying because their mind has been seared and their conscience has been seared and they say the shampoo will make you wonderful and they believe it <laughs> and so things like that happen we do have lie detectors how much lie destroys the truth how much lie destroys the truth if I went up to my wife and I said honey I've been 98% faithful to you today I'll be sleeping outside I'll have a big red slap mark on my cheek because 98% truth is a lie, right? No truth can have any lie in it. They just are counter, they're opposites. And in scripture we find the example. Saul, I completely destroyed the Amalekites. He said that. I wiped them out. And he got challenged and he said, no, they're gone. I did exactly what God said. I wiped out all the Amalekites. And Samuel's like, I hear sheep. What is this bleeding I hear? And is it true the king of the Amalekites is still alive? 98% hmm. of his truth was 100% lie. He did not destroy the Amalekites. There's a relationship between love and truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. They perished because they refused to love the truth, and so be saved. I've got to love that piece of leather that's been passing around. I've got to love my belt of truth enough that every day, every morning, I get up and I put the thing on, and I understand what it's for. That the truth is 100% accuracy in my words and in my thoughts. 
And in my deeds, have you ever done this one? I've done this one sometimes. Oh, it's done. And it's 98% done. Well, it's almost 98% done. As soon as I get this, well, okay, so it's 96% done. Now I've got to go run and make my truth because I didn't tell him the complete truth. I have to go back to what I was doing and find the task and finish it, and now it's 100% true. And I've tried to make a lie into the truth. You ever done something like that? It's roughly done. Or is it done or is it not done? If it's done, you should be able to put your hands behind your back. You're done. Let's go check. Right? 100% truth. Love the truth. 1 Corinthians 14, or 13, in the chapter about love. Do you know truth is in there too? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. I can rejoice when I have my belt of truth. 1 John 3, 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. And we speak the truth in love. Do you love the truth? I have a belt of truth. The belt of truth. Look at this. It says on here, truth. You may not be able to read it in the back too well. 100% truth. How much truth? 100%. That means all of it. And you know what the best thing to do with a belt is? Every child should know this, right? Come here, son. Was it true or not? You need to learn how to do this. Because you're going to have children one day. 100% truth is what our belt is. It's not part true and part lie. It's 100% truth. This is Erica's belt. It won't fit around me. It goes about halfway. That's embarrassing. <laughs> but it, it has beautiful texture and purple and teal just like us. 100% truth. That's the belt of truth. You know where I put this thing in our house? I put it on the spanking wall. And it was right above the spanking wall. And I knew exactly where the belt was, the belt of truth. Do you love the truth? Or do you not? Now follow this. It's going to happen quickly. And there's a lot of scripture in here. God is truth. Remember we asked, why would the belt come first? Why would it be so important to be number one? God is truth. It's his nature. Psalm 31 and verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Romans 3, 4. Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. Deuteronomy 32. He's a rock. His work is perfect. His ways are just. A God of truth and without iniquity. John 17 and verse 3, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. John 7, 28, you know me, you know where I am from, I'm not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. This is the nature of God. This is why it's first. It's his order. It's not my order, I would choose the sword or the salvation helmet first, right? It's his order, and he's 100% true. He is true. Jesus is truth. Jesus answered them in John 14 and verse 16, or verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. What Jesus said is, I am truth. That's what I am. That's what I'm made out of. It's my essence. It's my being. In Revelation, his name is what? Faithful and true. Hebrews 13 and verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is truth. The Spirit is truth. In 1 John 5 and 6, the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Start to see a pattern. John 16, verse 13, when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. There's some serious power behind the truth. The truth is what saves you. In James 1, verse 18, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we could be first fruits. 1 Timothy 2, and verse 1, God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God, God chose to save you through truth. The word is truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. The word is truth. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. That's Jesus' words. The Christian walk is the truth. 
3 John 1 and verse 3. He gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And guess what? The church is the truth. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. You will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So if you follow all these scriptures, God, who is truth, sent Jesus, the truth, to save you through truth, by the word of truth, to push you inside of, put you inside you the spirit of truth and put you on a walk of truth in the church of truth. All of those things are true. And that's why the belt is so much more important than we think. The belt is the truth. It's the foundation. It's 100% true. And it's all of God's nature. What's the opposite of truth? Now we moved through some fun, hard scriptures. We're going to move into some other hard scriptures. The opposite of truth is what? You should know this. What's the opposite of truth? It's a lie. Right? A lie. We demolish arguments and every pretension that self sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It's a lie that we fight against. Colossians 3 verse 9 says, don't lie to each other. You put off that old stuff, don't lie to each other. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, Satan masquerades in a big lie, like a servant of light, like an angel. John 8 and verse 44, you belong to your father the devil, you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. You can't have 98%. You're either one or the other. And in this case, Satan is pure lie. He speaks lie as his native language. He's the father of lies. Lies weaken and doubt your belt. The mobility and the usefulness of it is impaired. Your leaders must have truth. Your leaders are expected in their qualifications to be truthful. First examination we might want to make. Are they truthful? Can I count on every word that comes out of his mouth to be 100% true? I know men like that. That will tell me the absolute 100% truth. If what they say happened, I don't have to worry about it. That's what happened. And that's wonderful. And if every one of us was like that, imagine how strong it would be. 100% truth. We must all speak the truth in love. So I want to show you a bowl of lies. Okay? This scripture is what I found for the opposite of truth in Jeremiah 9 and verse 3. They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It's not by truth that they triumph. Revelation 22, remember who's thrown in there? Whoever loves and makes lies. So there's a bow of lies that is the opposite of truth. I thought I'd give you a demonstration of that one. Who wants to shoot me? <laughs> Alright, here's my bow of lies. Now, here's how this works. There are little hooks on the arrow of lies. And when you put them inside of these two little rings right here, and you let them go, they're going to come at me. Alright? Who wants to go first? I will let you go first. So come stand over here. Here, you take the bow. All right, you got to try to shoot me. Oh! <laughs> All right, here. We got to have some other house on the turn. You want to try it? Okay. Come over here. This is not dangerous, and I am wearing eye protection. Okay. It's dangerous. Ooh. That one whistled. Oh, how cool is that? Okay, Satan is doing this to me with real lives, by the way. I kind of want to be more protected than I am. Nice. <laughs> nice shot. Good job, guys. <coughs> you set that on that bench. This is Satan's job. 
He is firing lies at me all day long, nonstop. He doesn't need to sleep. He doesn't take rests and nap. He doesn't get weak and tired. And he's doing that. I need the belt of truth, don't I? Here's three lie arrows that commonly come at me. We just saw three arrows flying. The first one, there is no absolute. You're going to see this in school. They're going to teach you this. There's no real absolute that Generation X people like me prove it. Okay, I'll do something, but prove why I need to do it, and I'll be okay. Generation Y below me is, if it's not on video, it didn't really happen. <laughs> and so, and there's a proof. There's no proof. This is what we're dealing with in our society. Define and determine for yourself if it is true or not. This is how you're taught, right? It's a lie. And yet you're taught, well, you can define whatever truth is. Red can be sort of pink or blue or orange or what, you know, if you really, whatever. It's a lie. Jesus very clearly said you can know the truth. Lie number two, the second arrow. Culture must adapt. The church needs to change. Because culture is changing so much, the church needs to adapt and change too. Change its foundation. Change the way it thinks. It's not practical. The Bible is too restrictive. This is what you're going to be taught. And these are these arrows that Satan is shooting at you all the time. Your approach must be wrong because it's not working. Look how your numbers are dwindling. Therefore, you're, you must be doing things not the way God wanted you to do it, and, and it's wrong. These are lies that we hit. You know the church in Corinth had temple prostitutes and loud, outspoken women and rampant remarriage? At the time it was written, they had these problems. And we have allowed people to say the culture should determine what the church does. So dangerous. The church cannot change the truth. Number three, the Bible doesn't have a pattern. It teaches tolerance. And look at these verses about do not judge. And look at these verses about, or verses about circumcision or eating of meat. See? The, the church should just accept everyone the way they are. How holy and how righteous to accept everyone the way they are. <coughs> Dangerous, dangerous lies. And there's no balance, there's no gray in truth. Truth is either truth or it's not. There's no option for 98%. How can we counter these arrows? Number one, we have biblical authority. Whatever we do must be authorized by Christ. We can point and say, here's why we do what we do. Look at what Jesus said. I don't have to wonder whether or not I need to define the word truth because truth is 100%. And God is 100% true. In Him there's no lie. There's no shadow. There's no turning. All Scripture is useful. It gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Join in, this is Philippians 2, or Philippians 3.17, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take those, take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Is there a pattern in Scripture? Sure. There sure is. Yes, there is. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. Many will follow the shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into dispute. This is the goal of Satan. To make the truth, the belts, eh, I don't think you should wear that. I really don't. Because it might not be true. That's what Satan wants you to think that the way of truth should come into dispute. We should argue about it. We should fight about it. We should change our foundation a little bit. That's what those arrows are for. Peter, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, what did he hold as his standard? The belt. Peter said, I see the truth of the gospel here, and it doesn't line up to what you are doing. Something is different. One of these two things can change. And it's not the truth of the gospel that can change, because the belt is 100% truth, and it's God's essence. Therefore, what you're doing, Peter, is not in line with the truth of the gospel. This is how we counter those arguments. We don't say, I really think that, or, well, I'm sure it's a better idea that. No. We say, here's the measure of the gospel, and whatever you're doing is not measuring up to it. We point them to Scripture. It's the only way that this will work. Because it's the only measure, the only solid truth that we have. 
Hebrews 5 and verse 12. You need somebody to teach you the elementary truths of God's word over again. I had those words spoke, spoke to me one time. I don't think you got the foundational teaching, son. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I need to go back and look at the foundational truths of God's word. The Bereans searched to see if what Paul said was true. What did they go against? What was their measure? What was their standard? Truth. That's the first thing. Why was scripture written? Luke 1 and verse 4. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Why did they sit down and write the scriptures the way they did? So I can know with certainty what is true. And call everything else a lie. Find authorizations for all of your actions. All of them. That means if I think about bringing a prop to show you guys in church, I better find out if there was a prop that was shown in the Bible. Did Jesus say, bring me a fish? He did. Show me who's on this coin. He did. And as a master teacher, that gives me authorization to do things like this. It's out there. It's wild, I know. But Jesus did it. We must find authorization for everything we do, all of our actions. The word is truth. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. It actually is the word of truth. That's how they accepted it. This is how I need to accept it. I don't know, maybe it's weird I should look at it and, and use some, no. It is the word of God, I should accept it as the word of God, as the word of truth, which it actually is. I don't question my belt whether, hmm, is this real leather? Oh, now I'm going to find out if this vinyl stuff is real leather. And the answer is no. My belt of truth is a fake. <laughs> that one's real leather. That's real brass. I put blood and sweat in that. This, I'm not so sure. It's kind of got some, it's not real leather. How is your approach to the truth? You say, well, I don't know if what God said is real true or not. And I should look it over and examine it. Or do you accept it as it actually is the word of truth? Maintain your belt. This is a wonderful thing that God did with a belt in the Bible. In Jeremiah. And God told him to do this thing. I bought a belt, as the Lord directed, and I put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the belt you bought and are wearing around your waist. Now, go to Parath and hide it there in a crevice of the rocks. So, I went and hid it at Parath, as God told me many days later. The Lord said to me, now, go to Parath and get that belt. I told you to hide there. So, I went to Parath and I dug up the belt from the place where I'd hidden it, but now it was ruined and completely useless. Why would God go to all this trouble? Take your belt and go out there and bury it somewhere. Well, here's exactly what happens. If this belt were buried in the ground, all of the oil and all the moisture, if it was real leather, all of the oil and all the moisture would come draw out of it. So when I got this belt, it would still sort of look like a belt, and I would try to strap it around myself and it would go snap, because it would crack and break. It lost all its moisture and all its pliability, and it's gone. And God put this whole complicated story in here to teach Jeremiah this very principle. If you don't maintain your belt, and you don't wear it every day, and you put it somewhere, and you bury it somewhere, it will decay and fail. And Satan is out there shooting lies. Your belt must be maintained. It will get brittle if it's not used. It will no longer be flexible. It will fail you. The arrow comes. You're a Generation X, and you should prove that the Scripture is true. Prove it to me. The arrow's on its way to me, and I'm not wearing my belt. And I have no truth to stand on. And I say something, oh, well, I think, snap, my belt just broke. Well, 58% of the people recommend, man, my belt just broke. I've wasted an opportunity that God gave me to maintain his standard of truth. How are you at wearing your belt? I want to share you one more thing before we're closing. I'm almost there. The scariest thing I could think of, the scariest thing I could find in Scripture about the truth. What if God withheld his word? What if there was no standard of truth like this? No belt of truth. How scary would that be? And yet he did this. 
Amos 8 and 11 through 13, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. You should be scared right now. This, think of this. God's going to withhold his word from mankind. What a famine. <clears throat> Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the lovely young women and the strong young men will faint because of thirst. How terrible. How terrible is that? I can't even imagine in my mind how terrible it is, and yet guess who? Every person that does not have Christ is in a famine of the word. What am I doing playing with this stuff? When there are men and women out there that don't have the belt of truth. They can't maintain anything. And they're in a famine and they're longing for water. And they're longing for word and they don't have it. How terrible that would be. Ephesians 2 verse 12. That was an Old Testament scripture. So I wanted to make sure you understood it's in the New Testament too. Without hope and without God in the world. This is the condition of men. My friends, my co-workers are in this condition. Do I have time to do anything else but go help them? Go help them find the word of truth. I need to teach them what a belt is. Are you in a famine without the word? I think it would be great if. My studies show that you're in a famine if you cannot point to the word when it comes time for the truth. When the doubt comes, when the lies comes, if you can't point to the word, you're in a famine. You're starving. And the only way to counter those lies is with the word. Are you a pillar of truth? We have two pillars up here. One of them's a pillar. The other one, I, don't, I think I would call it rubble. It's over. It's fallen. It's gone. Which one are you? Are you wearing your belt or are you not wearing your belt? So I hope I've helped you understand a little bit about one piece of armor. The belt of truth. Why is it important? Because God is 100% truth. It's what he is. When he looks at that pile, the first thing that comes to his mind is the belt of truth. It's the foundation for everything else. It's the pillar of the truth. The pillar, the church. It's what the spirit is. It's what Jesus is. <clears throat> it counters those arrows. So hopefully you have been encouraged and benefited by some of the study. I know that when I look at this thing, I get excited. It's the funnest thing in Scripture for me to look at these items. So I believe at this time we'll have a song of invitation.